Hi everyone, welcome back to Going Online, Reimagining Teaching and Learning. And I'm your host, Claire Macken, Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor, Teaching and Learning in the College of Business and Law at RMIT University. It's so fantastic to be back here again. And what's even more fantastic is my kids are back in school. So this means there is zero risk of a teenager crashing my background today. But talking about crashing, my internet has been crashing all day, the joys of working at home. So if I suddenly disappear, you will know why. Luckily, we are so well prepared. I have a, another host standing by, ready to take over, James Adenopoulos. Thanks, James, I appreciate it. Fingers crossed it's all okay. So this is our fourth episode in our webinar series brought to you by Texa in collaboration with RMIT. Our other three sessions have addressed big topics, getting started in best practice for establishing online learning, enabling staff to work in an online learning environment, and last week, assessment integrity. And today we are discussing designing curriculum for the online environment. And I have a exciting announcement for you today. So every week I've been encouraging you to give us lots of questions and you've been absolutely amazing. So thank you to our wonderful audience. We've now had all of our previous webinar questions answered uh, by an expert. You'll find all of the answers on the Texa website in the same place that you find our previous webinars. So uh, today, as always, ask as many questions as you like. I'll choose a few that our panelists can answer in as much time as we have. Uh, we'll fill up with questions and answers. And if we can't manage to answer the questions, we'll get you an answer. So have a look at the Texa website for those. As always, today's session is being recorded, so you can watch it again if you liked it. Um, Texa may use the recording in lots of different ways. You can find it on Texa's website under online learning with their privacy policy at texa.gov.au privacy. And just this week is one of our most important weeks, National Reconciliation Week. It's a time for all Australians to learn about our shared histories, cultures and achievements and to explore how we can contribute to achieving reconciliation in Australia. So everyone here in the audience, we come from all over Australia today. Um, so let us acknowledge and the traditional owners of the lands you are individually on right now and their continuing connection to land, waters and community. And we pay our respects to their cultures, country and elders past, present and emerging. And I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm on right now here in Melbourne, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. So turning to today's webinar, it's on the topic of designing curriculum for an online environment. And we have two expert panelists this week, Bridget Sloot, Manager of Teaching Development and Educational Design from the Australian Institute of Business. Bridget is passionate about creating high quality education, student centred learning and staff development. She is currently a manager teaching development at the AIB, which I just said, and she um, helps students learn effectively and efficiently. She collaborates with academic staff to design and develop an outstanding MBA curriculum, and she brings in perspectives from her roles as a language teacher, librarian and IT trainer. And as a fully online student herself in a Masters of Education, she understands how students want to spend their time to learn online. Uh, our other panelists today, Dr. David Bowser, CEO and founder of Curio. And David has 20 years experience in education, research and development and financial services, both as an academic at Melbourne and Cambridge universities for 14 years and as a leading strategy consultant where he was retained by CEOs, government departments and their executive teams to advise on their most complex strategic issues. He was NAUS Group Principal and Education Sector Leader for six years. And in 2015, he created Curio Group, a collective of advisors, educators and product developers focused on working directly with education and training organisations to improve human learning. In 2016, Curio established Academy to provide online education development delivery services to universities. David's known for his strong analytical capability, innate curiosity and enthusiasm to develop insights for clients that can be embraced by an organisation and readily implemented by staff. 
So we're going to get started. My internet actually held up, which I'm really impressed um, by the way. So hopefully I stay with you for the full time. Um, and my first question is over to Bridget. And don't forget, audience, please ask our questions in the chat. Um, we'll, we'll get to you. And if you like a question that's been asked, give it a upvote and we'll try to get to those first. So over to you, Bridget. How can the curriculum be designed to help students learn effectively and efficiently online? Thank you, Claire. Um, this is a question that uh, is really close to my heart because as an online student, you want to actually work, uh, learn as effectively and efficiently as possible. Uh, you don't want to waste time on redundant information. So I've got three tips or three kind of guiding principles uh, in the way to do that for students as uh, based on cognitive science. And the first one is really um, effective learning happens when students can focus. Contrary to popular belief, um, we cannot multitask. <laughs> I know that Claire manages it very well, but um, we can't do that. So we need to actually design for that. So in order to focus, we need to uh, tell students to focus their attention on what they need to learn and do. And to do that, we need to use the how principle, provide them a, gu a guide through that knowledge. And that's where the learning design comes in really. How do we design that students can get that knowledge most effectively? So let's start with the focus principle. The focus principle is essentially about we need to tell students on what um, they need to focus on. So uh, Aristotle had three types of three kind of knowledge for students to know, which is basically knowing why you want to do something, knowing how you want to do something and knowing what to do. So those three principles we need to incorporate. That is really the, the why and the what is the theoretical knowledge, the purpose of this knowledge. Secondly, the productive is the guiding plan. How do we actually go and manage this knowledge? How do we put it into an, some sort of order? And, and thirdly, the practical knowledge is the informed action. OK, how are we going to use this knowledge? What are we going to do with it? So in order to create a good online curriculum, we can use that. Um, to basically decrease distractions for students and information overload for them because we are going to tell them what knowledge to focus on. How do we do that? How do we do that as um, academics or in collaboration with learning designers is by guiding them on what they are going to do. So this means actually um, quality over quantity. So don't try and bombard them with everything you know. Actually give them what they need to know to do the job. So one way to do that is to break down the content into smaller bits. You want to break it down, break it down, break it down. And you want to be able to explain that knowledge to someone who doesn't understand it. And this is where you can collaborate with other people, explain it to a learning designer who doesn't know anything about your topic and see if you can break that knowledge down. Another good way is to use analogies and to connect the students to any prior knowledge that they have. Also, really important to remove redundant information and duplicate information. So really the, the key there is simplify. Simplify everything you do. Um, you can also use family members, by the way. I find it really useful to explain something to my partner. And when he doesn't understand it, I need to know, I know I, know I need to refine what I'm talking about. Um, and then finally, the third one is design the guide. So, OK, this is where you put all your modularized content, all the little bits and pieces you've created. You design that into a, basically a plan, a view through which the students can view. So how can they focus without a guide? So basically a guide is like a binocular and I use this little prop because it's really good to use an analogy. So what do you want students to focus on and where do you want them to go? So essentially, what you do is with all the content that you've got that you've modularized, what you want to do is tell students why it's important to read this. Why is it important to listen to this? Why is it important to watch this? Then you need to make each item actionable. OK, what are the students going to do with that knowledge? How are they going to use it? So I really like to use the what, why and how technique, which is basically tell them what they're going to be doing. Tell them why it's important for them to know that. What's the purpose of it and how to do it? OK, they won't need and uh, know that by magic. 
um, they will actually need to be told that. And what you then provide is opportunities for students to recall and apply that knowledge on a regular basis because you've chunked it all up into smaller bits. They're slowly recalling and adding more information. And essentially that's my three tips for um, creating really good online curriculum design. Oh, we back to you, Claire. Thanks, Bridget. That's awesome. Uh, and yes, I have spent most of my professional life explaining things to my very patient husband uh, as practice for teaching and learning. I don't think he, he would listen, though. Um, David, over to you, a question, and I am so excited to ask you this question. It's already a similar question has had eight upvotes already today, and I see your upvotes, audience. Thank you. We will definitely get to those ones with a big one. Someone's got 15 upvotes already. Um, there's been a lot of debate about what the return to campus looks like and prioritising STEM first, especially where labs are necessary. Can we not meet the needs of these courses in online environments? What are some online designs that be, have been successful in delivering in this space? Over to you, David. Thanks, Claire, and hi, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to, to join you all today. Um, so designing curriculum in an online in, environment for, for STEM from our experience and what I've seen is really does involve a lot of creativity and really thinking outside of the box in order to create those different experiences. And of course, it is a massive area and it's a very different area. It's easy for us to often just group STEM into one particular sort of bundle, but of course it covers around about two thirds of most university teaching. It's got engineering, science, mathematics, medical sciences, health sciences, there are just so many. So the challenge then comes in the way that students not only develop the knowledge, but importantly, the skills, because they're often very skill-based topics. So how do we get the right blend then of the assimilative learning aspects of lectures and videos and listening to audio files to create more shorter and more demonstrative experiences? How do we take tutorials and seminars into more of a flipped mode where there are questions and work that they need to be doing before they actually get into the, to the actual experience online and also more for the peer learning? But then the really big part that, of course, everyone's talking about, and that's what I'm seeing also in the, the questions that are coming around, how do we deal with lab classes? As practical classes, how do we deal with problem based learning classes in the medical and health sciences and how can we really rethink about them? So there's a few things that I've seen in recent months where universities and other providers have had to really jump online quickly, as you can imagine, because so many universities have had to jump on so quickly in order to be able to get a lot of what they're doing online. And this includes some of those really large first year subjects across STEM disciplines, which can have thousands of students in them. And from a sort of architecture perspective around the, the curriculum, of course, you want to have the opportunity to rethink what is the architecture, what is the experience, what is the strategy for this particular learning experience for students. But when we've been put into it and thrown into the deep end literally in two months and had to move quickly online, sometimes that hasn't been as easy to do. So I'll be interested to see what comes up over the next semester and next year as people start to think about the online environment. But for right now, it's becoming more around demonstrations, but also thinking creatively about what can students actually do in their own environments. So for example, in biological sciences, often thinking about flora and fauna and what's going on, creating field experiments where someone can go down to a local park, for example, map out a meter square and start thinking about what are all of the different types of plants or insects or animals or what's in the soil, etc. and running small experiments can actually be done in that way. And one university I do know of is actually doing that at a very large scale where they're engaging around a thousand first year biology students in doing field work across the city in thinking about how can we then share all of those experiences and bring them back, whereas normally they would probably be doing it around the university campus. They've been able to do it in that way. In other areas such as in physics and engineering, there have been recordings and demonstrations that they've been able to go through or they can run a small group laboratory class online at the same time with a good camera set up just behind them, a bit like what we've got here today, a camera set up, being able to film them doing a particular experiment. And there's some um, really interesting academics, I think, particularly in the, uh, and I'll give a quick shout out to what I've seen from the School of Physics at the University of Sydney, who have been doing some really interesting experiments that are online on YouTube, if people want to go and have a look at them, where they've been dropping weights and all sorts of things as a way of trying to bring to life different types of experiments around mechanics and gravity and all of those sorts of aspects of it. 
Problem-based learning classes in clinical teaching are a particularly difficult one, but also an interesting one, and they often revolve and require a lot of pre-work in order to be able to deliver them online, which hasn't been um, which we haven't really had the opportunity to. However, they are set up for being able to be taught in an online environment because it's mostly about the facilitated experience and the students being able to learn and work off each other and have more of that peer aspect of it. The big part, of course, and you might refer to it as the, the calent, sort of the uh, elephant in the room, is clinical work and clinical placements. And it's very hard, obviously, to be able to do a clinical placement from home. And, you know, there's only so many students and so many of their... Um, their, uh, you know, co-working at home colleagues, if you want to call them that at the moment, that can actually do different types of practical things on each other and think about how does the body respond and and work in those different environments. So I think that's a particular challenge. Some universities that have been in this space for some time in teaching clinical sciences and health and nursing, etc., online, often set up their students with um, different types of VR headsets, like cheaper versions that can be attached to an iPhone that enable them to be able to have more of an immersive experience on um, how you do certain things, etc. But of course, the real experience comes through the more expensive equipment, and of course, not everyone can afford to be to be doing that. So I think there's absolutely some things that we can do in STEM, and but it does require a very creative mindset to think about once again putting that human-centered learner design at the center of it all and thinking about well if i've got to get them through this particular curriculum to meet these learning outcomes and be able to meet some of these assessments how can i be really creative in thinking of the different ways that i can approach this so that's how i do it claire thanks david that's awesome advice and i'm so glad we've actually addressed that question it's every week um, so thank you and good news my internet is holding up so i'm still here uh, my next question is over to Bridget and the question, um, so it had, I think, several upvotes. So should the online curriculum take into consideration live delivery or recorded lectures or voice recorded lecturer and short videos to ignite discussions? Over to you, Bridget. I think your mute is on, Bridget. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't get the prompt to unmute, you know, so <laughs> I can only focus on one thing at a time. <laughs> so I was focusing on the question, uh, but indeed, uh, this is a, a commonly asked question and I would actually ask uh, answer this uh, with any other content item is why do you want to use this? So what is is the purpose for using it? Also, I mean, there's a bit of a mixed bag in there. Of course, you can have um, certain short videos as conversation starters. Again, you need to explain to students why are they watching this video, for what purpose, to what, you know, why, why should we be watching this video? Why should we be watching a live uh, presentation of someone else? Why should we watch? Of course, it's a great way to put in, uh, build in different perspectives, but I think we always need to look at the why. Now, in terms of actual recorded lectures, I think the really important thing there is if someone has recorded a lecture, they have made a plan. It's like a lesson, right? You have made a plan to do this and you've incorporated certain elements based on the fact that you're there in the lecture. So if you're going to use that lecture, you need to also think about that. What elements do I want to use about this? So it needs to probably be cut down to the bits that you need rather than using everything. I hope that answers the questions. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Bridget. Fantastic. Uh, I'm still forgetting to mute myself, by the way. I've been at home for eight weeks. So, David, over to you. Uh, big popular question, 21 upvotes. Do you believe that there should be a different focus for postgrad students versus undergrad students when it comes to online design and delivery? I absolutely think there needs to be a different design for postgrad and undergrad students, but it's not really about the difference between postgrad and undergrad, but we often think about it that way. The difference is in thinking about the person that's actually going to be having the learning experience. And they come at it from different things in life, different experiences, different wants, different needs. And what we want to be doing when we're thinking about designing online curriculum and online learning strategies, of course, is thinking about, well, who's actually going to be doing this? A bit like what Bridget was just talking about. Who is actually going to be getting through this particular program? What are they like on a day-to-day -day basis, for example? Now, in some online programs in undergraduate 
courses, they do have a tendency, and this is what the market research tells us, the people do tend to be often first in family. Um, being online, they're often in regional centres, so not necessarily in a, in a metropolitan area. They're often thinking about it as a career change, and they're often in their sort of 30s, roughly. So that's a very different undergraduate student to the typical on-campus undergrad student who is most likely, you know, 17, 18, 19. This is their first degree. They've come out of a high school experience, so this is learning has been their thing. They're sort of managing maybe a part-time job as opposed to someone who's possibly doing undergrad study online who's possibly managing kids and a family and all sorts of other things that's going on in terms of their working life at the same time. For postgrad students, particularly in an online environment, they often tend to be people who are either looking for a career change, a job change, or they're looking to upskill in a particular area. Once again, they're looking for a different experience. It's a very different one to what an undergraduate student experience is. So the way that I think about these things in and I would recommend people do think about it this way is thinking from a human centered design perspective of who are we designing for? What is this online experience being designed for? Is it for someone to come out the other side of this particular program with new skills and competencies? And then how does it blend into their work and their life in postgrad? Therefore, we want to try and draw in more of their peers as well. We want them to be able to create networking opportunities with their students, but also with potentially the academic or the online facilitator who's working with them because they're already working in the business. We want the course to be really industry specific and authentic. We won't want a whole bunch of essays and multiple choice of exam questions when we're trying to assess them. We actually want something that's more authentic about their experience. It might be, for example, in and if they're learning about how to manage online products, as just an example that seems rele relevant at the moment, you want them to be thinking about it from the perspective, well, what if you actually had to do this? Because this is meant to be about the learning. There's no point in us asking a whole bunch of multiple choice questions about have they actually learnt, you know, this particular theory, et cetera, of product management. Let's see it actually get applied. But in an undergraduate experience, it is going to be more around the theory, more around the conceptual understanding of what you're trying to learn. So I do think it's very different, but I wouldn't think about it just as postgrad and undergrad. I'd think it about from the learner's perspective, Claire. Thanks, David. That's fantastic. And um, yes, I totally agree as, as well. Um, so I just found out something very cool that I can actually sort your questions by the most liked. Like this is groundbreaking. I've been doing this for four weeks and I just worked that out. Um, so that means that I can now definitely address your questions in the right order. Um, and the one that actually comes up next is for Bridget and in designing a curriculum, should there be a balance of asynchronous and synchronous delivery to address issues of access and equity? Thanks, Bridget, over to you. Um, great question. And uh, I'd like to thank David for his answer. I think that was really spot on and uh, certainly building in a practical experience that was it's really important to be able to uh, have people apply what they learn. Um, so yes, in terms of asynchronous and synchronous, absolutely, there should it should be designed into the system. And in terms of access and equitability, I think we're actually getting a little bit. It's getting a little bit better here because let's face it, what we're doing now is providing a lot more access to people uh, that previously didn't have access to this kind of facility. So even me as an online uh, learner, one of the things I really missed is actually connecting with people. Now there was very few classes in which I actually got to synchronously connect with people. And to me, this actually builds that collaboration, build those networks, that community that you don't get if you don't have anything synchronous. Now, the platform that we're using at where I work is Zoom, and it does automatically transcribe what is being said. So what that means is for accessibility reasons, at least people can read the transcription as well as listen to it. Uh, I think uh, we, uh, give every student access to to uh, download the transcripts, to download the recording, and to refer to it often afterwards as well. So we use the synchronous and the asynchronous platform together, and that's actually also built into the design of the course. So it goes back to that really good online design, actually builds in those opportunities. So sometimes when I was talking before about actionable items, actionable content, that might be that you pose some questions to students within uh, an asynchronous discussion forum, but then you will let them know that they will be answered in a synchronous platform at this time. And if they cannot join, then they can pose those questions before or after, very much like what we're doing today. 
That over to you, Claire. Thanks. Thank, thanks, Bridget. Um, yes. So keep your questions coming, guys. They're slowing down a little bit, so we love love your questions and, of course, your upvotes. So, David, um, over to you. Do you have any suggestions regarding ensuring online group assessments continue to meet um, learning outcomes? Wow, now there's a really thorny one, and particularly <laughs> in the online environment, of course. Um, as we all know, it's probably the pet hate of many students is the group assignment, even in an on-campus experience experience, but in an online experience with people that you possibly haven't met um, before face to face, it can be an even more thorny one. Um, and I was talking to a friend of mine actually just over the weekend who had a group assignment coming up online and they were already cursing it. <laughs> so I think there's these are though very important and I absolutely do believe that group assessments are a core part of any learning experience. And and particularly any authentic learning experience. And the reason I say that is it's very unusual in this day and age to be doing a piece of work and working in an organization where you are not a member of a team and you have to get something done collectively. It is extremely unusual. So therefore it is a more authentic experience. Now the argument might be, well, you know, there are different alignments and people of different objectives and different rationales and people are going to be wanting to put in different work etc whereas in a workplace everyone's sort of centered around the same reason for being and wanting to actually be able to deliver yes that is true but you also need to be able to work out from a team is how to get the most out of that team and out the most out of those team members so thinking about how do we actually ensure that online group assessments actually do meet the learning outcomes i think we absolutely can and that's once again ensuring that our learning outcomes are about being authentic are about the opportunity that they're absolutely creating about the knowledge and skills that you're seeking to develop particularly in stem based disciplines and we can absolutely do it if we've got the right learning outcomes and that those learning outcomes do talk about group experiences and what you can actually learn from a group the other little bit of sort of a tip that I've seen for online group work is actually explaining at the start of an online course, for example, to the students about the importance of group work and why we're actually doing it. And in some cases, potentially even running through an experience or a story, because as we know, as humans, we love to learn from stories. Perhaps drawing on the, the great work of Patrick Lencioni and the five dysfunctions of a team so that we can actually call each other out on it and people can actually learn at the same time about how to work in teams. That's how I'd be starting to think about it and approach it, Claire. Thanks, David. Uh, yes, I did all the group work as well when I was a student, as you would imagine. Uh, question for Bridget. So um, should the online schedule be run at a different schedule for face-to-face? -face? Thank you, Claire. This is a very interesting question to me because as an online learner, you don't actually care about it, whether the terms are run differently, you know, it just sort of has to suit you. And I think that I guess with the advent of people studying more online fully, uh, it basically means that terms are almost irrelevant, right? Uh, it's more important what's going on in your life. So I think actually providing more um, different terms would be really good for online students. So as an online student, I'm working full time and I'm studying. If I have different schedules, that were really good. But I'd like to also point out a different perspective on this because it's the uh, obviously the educators that need to also be available to teach these terms. You know, just because it's online doesn't mean mean it's any easier because you want to have that synchronous um, uh, engagement with the with the students. And so basically that would build in a whole nother work model, I suppose, for staff that are teaching um, these subjects. So they're the two perspectives, but I think there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't do that. Have it have different terms for online or at the same time, I don't think it really matters. Well, it's best for the student. <laughs> oh, thank Thanks. you, Claire. Thanks, Bridget. Um, so, David, question for you, bit of a long one, but important. Online classes often are looked at as an easy economical way of running classes with lower than average fixed cost incurred. This often means relying on the generic material provided by publishers as instructor resources often developed by the TAs of the authors. 
Do you think effective online curriculum needs to be a paradigm shift where online curriculum is seen to be on par with traditional teaching, often needing more care and quality control to ensure an effective learning experience? Big question, important question, over to you. Absolutely, thanks Claire. Yeah, thank you also for the for the question from the audience. I think it's a really interesting one as well. I might just start by trying to sort of differentiate at least the difference, and I'm sure you all know it and it might be telling you, you know, to suck it, so to speak, but the difference between learning and teaching. And learning in our perspective is really about the, the student and the student experience and how they can take resources and materials and discussion with peers and practical classes, as well as everything else that they know when they come into a particular program to be able to learn a new knowledge set or a skill or whatever it happens to be. Teaching is one component of that that comes in. And I absolutely believe and wholeheartedly believe that teaching is a very much a core part of student learning. Um, Teachers are the absolute core. And in fact, when we think about it, what we actually remember about our experiences in school and often in universities was that amazing teacher who taught us about science and ignited it something that was really fired in our belly or the, the tutor in first year accounting who was absolutely passionate about their subject, even though it was extremely dry. And the learning and the teaching aspect of it becomes really important. I think if we think about online classes as just being an easy economical way of doing teaching, I actually don't think that necessarily stacks up. And what a lot of universities have probably learned over the last few months and other providers, of course, in delivering online classes is that it actually isn't as economical as having 500 students in a lecture theatre, for example. It's actually quite a different experience and it's actually quite a different cost structure. If you want to really deliver a fantastic teaching experience, it's actually more akin to running a number of small group classes is the better way of thinking about it. The most economical, and I guess economical, let's just say it for what it is, the cheapest way to do it is by just delivering big, large lectures and delivering them three or four times a week, not through small group teaching. But yet the learning experience you would probably argue, and I would certainly argue, is much better in a small group experience. So do I think that effective online curriculum needs a paradigm shift to be on a par? I think it's really about realising what is online learning as opposed to what I would refer to many organisations doing at the moment, which is remote teaching. Online learning is about that overall encompassing experience, whereas online or remote teaching is really about trying to do the same thing that we've been doing just through a digital channel. So I think I've tried to answer that that question, Claire. It's, it certainly is a long one and a, and a curly one. So I don't think it's necessarily a paradigm shift, but I think it's about understanding what is the difference between teaching and learning. Yeah, great answer. And uh, yes, I think a lot of paradigm shifts lately as a result of COVID-19, which is why we're here. Mm -hmm. uh, question for Bridget. So are there any principles that you feel are not an appropriate rule of thumb to apply to online unit design, for example, diverging learning outcome uh, objectives, academic disciplines, cultural context or individual learner differences, or do you feel that they are always applicable in online unit design? Over to you, Bridget. Thank you, Claire. I certainly uh, would just be very easy answer is yes, <laughs> um, because let's face it, um, we need to be uh, aware of all these things in w whatever we do. I actually don't believe there's a big difference between really good uh, online learning and face-to-face um, -face learning. Um, so we actually can learn together with other people uh, and therefore we need to take into account what those other people's differences are, their cultural differences, the discipline differences. So I, I can't actually reiterate it enough that the important things, the way to achieve that is by collaborating with other people in order to get your um, course shaped so that it does incorporate a lot of different perspectives uh, and, and is accessible for a lot of people. So 
the way I guess I do that in my role is by basically collaborating very strongly with the academics to build that online environment and only by then and then we actually throw it through lots of th different people to get lots of different perspectives so students and we evaluate every single time to do this to see what we can improve so in actual fact I actually find it a little bit easier to do that in an online environment because you do design for online and you probably don't do as much of that when you're in the classroom. You might just walk into a lecture theater and it might just be a little bit more ad-libbing. Uh, whereas it's a, uh, very much, if you do it right and you do it with a team of people, you can build in a lot of different perspectives and that every time you can build uh, an improvement cycle to improve things and build on your strengths and get rid of some of the bugbears. So, um, yeah, that's that would be my answer. Thank you very much, Claire. Thanks, Bridget. Um, and I have a comment from Peter in the in the question and answer, which is when I taught providing distance education, I use discipline specific lecture templates. They use the what, why and how and incorporated a so what uh, or more carefully phrased. So what does it mean? And asked at least four times to force the student to think about the application of knowledge and therefore enforce understanding. It's actually, uh, I love that advice, it's something that I learned uh, when I worked for Apple for a while. So question for David, and I, I'm really interested in this um, as well. How do you believe breakout rooms within Zoom or whatever platform or their equivalents in other applications are best utilised within the context of an online lecture? Absolutely. Thanks, Claire. And Zoom has turned out to be, um, it's almost like a word in itself, isn't it? Um, like Googled and etc. I zoomed into a meeting. Um, I think the, the functionality of Zoom, which is the, the breakout rooms, is actually probably the most used functionality that I've seen lately, particularly in um, where you're trying to use it for larger classes, so probably you know 20 to 30 people, as opposed to this sort of a format with Teams, which is more of a webinar type of format. And the way that I've seen it used has been both where the facilitator has been able to select students to put them into groups to work together for a period of time, but also in also actually doing it random Randomly, which is a hell of a lot more fun as you can imagine because it then randomly selects a group of students of five or whatever it happens to be and then pushes them all into one space. The reason why I think it's been really effective is because as we all know sitting online on a Zoom conversation or a Teams meeting or WebEx or Citrix or whatever it happens to be for an hour or two is an extremely exhausting experience particularly with your camera on and people are increasingly becoming quite weary of it and they're moving Moving from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting, et cetera, et cetera. So by being able to create those smaller group experiences where people can go and work on something together is a really nice way of actually trying to break up the sometimes monotony of just having everyone sitting there in one particular room. But the thing that I've found that actually works really well with it, I'm, I don't want to sort of particularly endorse a particular product or platform out there, so I'll just be slightly careful about this, but using some very much shared online whiteboards um, can be a really, really useful thing to be able to use. And if you do a little bit of pre-preparation before the, the Zoom discussion, seminar, workshop, whatever you want to call it, tutorial, to be able to set up those different whiteboards for the different questions that you want the breakout groups to be able to address. And that ensures that everyone can actually see what the other groups have been discussing and everyone can actually interact with them as well. The one that we use the most um, and have the most experience with is a product that used to be called Real Time Whiteboard. I think it's now called Miro or MIRO. I can't remember actually how you actually say it, but it's a really useful product in, in uh, and platform for using in Zoom breakout sessions and it allows you to be able to set up those frames so that different student groups can be addressing particular questions and they can all be working in the same space at the same time. So that's how I think about um, doing Zoom meetings these days. Claire, I don't know if you've had similar experiences with being on Zoom a lot as well lately and using breakouts. Yeah, actually I spend about eight hours a day on Teams. So <laughs> today I teamed into a meeting. It's a bit like Hoover and Google, isn't it? It is. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, similar experiences definitely. So we've got time for two more questions that might ask you guys to keep it quick. Thanks for your perfect uh, questions today. If we didn't get to them, we'll get you some answers. And um, uh, the question I have for Bridget is, how do we select the competencies we will focus on and the depth and breadth of our scope if we're designing within the context of online modalities? 
Thank you, Claire. Um, I think this really goes back to initially what I was uh, talking about, which is basically uh, the focus, what you want students to focus on and not have anything that is extraneous to that. Sometimes it's very difficult to do when you're very passionate about your topic. Um, and also within, if you're talking about modalities, I guess you mean different means, uh, you know, we're viewing, we're listening, we're um, reading, all those sort of things. So um, the, it always goes back to the learning outcomes that you want for your subject, as well as the graduate attributes that you might have. So really, you need to focus on those things and, and then actually drill it down to simplify to the, the, the most essence of what the student needs to know. So I guess um, it's really hard to answer this question because how do you select the competencies? Again, I'd like to reference to go and talk to other people uh, as learning the designers in particular, but other people maybe that are in your area that uh, I can help you with that because really it's about trying to focus that attention to the learning outcomes. How do you get the students to achieve things in this in the quickest way possible? I hope that addresses the question and back to you, Claire. Perfectly, thank you. And our last question is um, to David. And in fact, someone's made a statement. So David, are you able to provide links to references or examples for some of the online examples you provided? Um, but the question, and, and we have a, probably about a minute, so it has to be pretty short, but having an interactive and interesting uh, lecture and tutorial is critical to ensure um, students see value in online classes. What would you recommend is the best course of action when your access to bandwidth is not consistent across the student cohort, particularly if you have international students stranded overseas but allowed to study as per normal, or indeed you have someone sitting in Melbourne on MBN and it's not connecting all day, like me. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. But as I was just thinking, in the background, that certainly the MBN gods have shined down upon you, Claire, uh, to be able to get through today, and you've probably used up all of that exciting bandwidth for the entire year now. Um, so yeah, look, keeping things interesting is absolutely a challenge in an online class, a bit like we we're just talking about with with Zoom and Teams and use of breakout rooms, etc. I think it's around more about actually mixing it up for the student. It doesn't always have to also be using the bandwidth hungry video and live video streaming. It. Etc. Audio can actually be just as good a tool and say to people to bring on their video at particular times. What I've also seen is that a lot of um, online tutorials are using other resources that are outside the actual streaming environment. So they'll say to people, go and follow this particular link, watch this YouTube or Vimeo video for six minutes, then we're going to come back at X time and we're going to be discussing these three questions about it. And it allows students to be able to sort of flip and change between the different experiences that they might need to do and have a different type of um, bandwidth demand as well. So I think it's around, once again, having that sort of creativity aspect of it and thinking about different ways that you can particularly um, mash it up for international students. Terrific, thanks David. And um, thank you everyone uh, today for another fantastic session. I'm glad I managed to stay with you the whole time. I used all my MBN luck on this. Um, thank you to our audience for your questions. If you can give us some feedback, it's like oxygen to us. So I'd love to know how you're finding this, how's it going for you, even a thumbs up or a thanks or whatever. And you can give also email feedback to onlinelearning at texa.gov.au online learning at texa.gov.au and don't forget to check out Texas websites, uh, heaps of great hints, tips, our previous webinars and now answers to your questions. I'd like to thank our two panellists today, Bridget Sloot and Dr David Bowser. And next week um, in session five, our second last session, we're going to welcome to the series Tom Whitford from the University of Melbourne. And I hope I say this right, Indumuthi V from the Engineering Institute of Technology, answering your questions on the topic of student experience and support. Uh, thank you everyone for attending today. It's been wonderful to have you here and we hope you enjoyed going online, reimagining teaching and learning and we'll see you next week. Bye.